Uh, this session is about immune and uh, pathological concept in MS. Uh, I am with uh, Christine Tranchant for moderating this uh, session. And it's a pleasure to call uh, Hans Peter Harton from Düsseldorf and uh, David uh, Laplo will do the presentation, please. So uh, I am very pleased and it's a, it's a great honor for me to uh, introduce uh, Professor Hartung. Uh, Professor Hartung is a leading expert in the field of uh, neuroimmunology applied to multiple sclerosis but also to uh, peripheral inflammatory neuropathies. He is the head of the Department of Neurology in uh, Dusseldorf, the University Hospital and he published more than 800 uh, papers in peer-reviewed journals, I, I think about 900 papers, and more than 100 uh, book chapters also, and is uh, a member of uh, editorial uh, boards of uh, several uh, prestigious uh, 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 journals that all of you know. And uh, I, I chose this uh, picture from uh, one of your uh, papers that you published in uh, Nature Neuroscience uh, uh, Reviews in uh, 2002, uh, because I, I, I remember well when uh, I was a, a neuroimmunology student and I, I used it uh, also in my uh, uh, manuscript of my thesis, for example, and, and so uh, it was a good memory for me. In this, uh, uh, in this picture, you, you summarize the, all the hypotheses uh, leading to, to MS. Uh, finally, uh, if MS is a primary autoimmune disease, that is now more or less consensual uh, as an hypothesis, but also uh, that uh, it may come from a, 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 an infectious triggering with viruses, uh, and also maybe from a secondary uh, autoimmune disease from a neurodegenerative process, uh, while probably it's not, uh, it's not the case. Um, but you, in this paper, you, you stressed on the on the possible role of, uh, of viruses. And I think it could be very interesting 15 years later to, uh, to see uh, what, wh where is the, the hypothesis now? And what do you think about the, 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 the role of viruses in uh, triggering the, the disease process? And particularly if we could make a focus on uh, endogenous retroviruses. And now I'm sure that in the, the, the next uh, 30 minutes we, we, you will present uh, uh, your data and uh, a review of the literature on, the, uh, on that topic. And uh, thank you very much for, for that. <laughs> Can we have the presentation from Professor Artun, please? Monsieur le Président, Professor Laplo, cher collègue et ami, thank you very much, David, for the very kind uh, introduction. I have to disappoint you up front. I uh, will not talk about um, the uh, endogenous retrovirus story because I've been charged really to review some of the quite gratifying and significant advances that have been made over the past 25 years in the development of uh, therapies based on an enhanced understanding of the immunopathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. Our university's patron is Heinrich Heine. He was a famous uh, poet and lyricist in the 19th century, um, a converted Jew who felt the intellectual and political oppression in, in Germany in those days and took refuge to France, to Paris, where he died. Uh, there is some evidence, and I, uh, I'm sure you understand why I tend to subscribe to the view that he suffered from multiple sclerosis. The more mundane theory goes that he suffered from syphilis and died from it. So the agenda is quite tight, and uh, by necessity, I need to condense uh, um, 
about the immunopathogenesis, the immunoactive treatments we have available, how they work, what target in the multiple pathways they address, how we monitor um, the efficacy and effectiveness of our treatments with the use of clinical MR measures, biomarkers, uh, how do we monitor risks, and how do we uh, set up a therapeutic concept, an algorithm that we apply um, to a given patient. And finally, uh, perhaps you could allow me some personal words on our president. So we heard wonderfully elaborated by Professor Comston the genetic underpinnings of multiple sclerosis. It's a complex disease with genes, particularly those related to the immune system, environmental factors, lifestyle factors, synergizing to produce the disease in individuals. The immunopathogenesis obviously prompted the exploration of therapies um, aimed at rectifying disturbed immunity, and they come in different classes from the classical uh, immunosuppressants, cytotoxic agents interfering with DNA biosynthesis. I may emphasize mitoxantron, but more recently teraflunamide, to those that influence more broadly cellular signaling messengers uh, agents that disrupt the trafficking from the peripheral immune system to the CNS of uh, cells. Um, and um, more recently, uh, the very interesting uh, advances in the use of agents that deplete immune effector cells and reconfigure the disturbed immune system. So this is the uh, temporal trajectory of immune interventions that we've seen uh, come to the front uh, and enlarge our therapeutic arsenal over the past 25 or so years with the broad spectrum immunosuppression initially, the uh, injectables, um, then uh, almost uh, uh, 10 years uh, for the appearance of the second, uh, next second generation uh, DMD. Um, and you see here the different categories uh, with uh, more efficacy, uh, perhaps more risks, uh, definitely uh, increasing our ambitions to achieve the goal of if we cannot cure the disease, uh, can we silence it at least for uh, some time. And the uh, works uh, along several lines, experimental, um, in vitro, ex vivo, uh, have uh, delineated a very complex uh, network of immune uh, reactions orchestrated by T and B cells, certainly as regards the inflammatory stage of multiple sclerosis. And these pathways are almost as complicated as the basal ganglia circuits. Uh, you see uh, both uh, pro-inflammatory T cells characterized by the signature of cytokines, regulatory T cells. So um, a continued attempt of the organism to balance potentially uh, autoaggressive responses by the appropriate uh, counter-regulatory mechanism, be they cell-based or humoral. Also, we noted in those past 25 years the return of the B cell. Um, the Rome group came up with uh, interesting uh, pathological observations of these collections of B cells, subpiely, um, giving rise also to the concept of a compartmentalized uh, immune response that would uh, sort of take precedence as the disease advances from the relapsing to the progressive stages. And perhaps we'll hear more from uh, Professor Lassmann, who really championed uh, also this concept. <laughs> 
but uh, a redefinition of the role of B cells really came from the astounding success of uh, therapies that depleted B cells. Uh, this is the traditional view that they serve as a factory of autoantibodies that may be demyelinating, but the kinetics of the rituximab and ocrelizumab trials clearly uh, focused on a more uh, proximal step of inter involvement of B cells in the immunopathological cascade, i.e., as an antigen presenter to T cells, as a driver of T cell proliferation and cytokine production. And uh, then to integrate these uh, findings in a concept, Mahad and, and colleagues, uh, Hans Lassmann, came up with uh, an attempt to um, contrast the uh, relapsing pathogenesis uh, of MS versus the uh, progressive, focusing uh, in relapsing uh, remitting multiple sclerosis on the role of the peripheral immune system, the repertoire of autoreactive T cells that in the wake of inflammation invade the central nervous system, cause demyelination um, and axonal damage, whereas um, in uh, progressive stages there would be an inflammation compartmentalized, a secluded microimmune system located in the central nervous system, not uh, easily accessible to uh, regulatory signals from the outside. Now, if we conceptualize uh, the uh, potential uh, categorical uh, targets of the immune interventions, we again see the peripheral nervous system with uh, classical agents, uh, monoclonal antibodies that would either deplete or somehow re, uh, in, uh, reconfigure the immune system, um, agents that would uh, retain autoreactive T cells in the periphery, not allowing them to access the central nervous system, uh, other ways to disrupt uh, the uh, migration process, um, and perhaps uh, agents that make their way and uh, operate uh, at least uh, also or in part in the central nervous system. And this may be uh, particularly uh, relevant to the progressive stages of the disease. Let's briefly talk about the uh, blood-brain barrier uh, and um, the um, uh, ways to uh, prevent uh, cells from entering the, uh, the central nervous system. You are all aware of the exemplary rational drug development of natalizumab uh, based on knowledge about the molecular pathways uh, involved in cellular migration, the integrins, uh, the uh, blockade of uh, integrins with subsequent disruption of the T cell endothelial interaction uh, in the animal model of EAE and the subsequent and successful clinical development of a monoclonal antibody against VLA4 natalizumab, an agent that has had at the time uh, produced unprecedented efficacy versus the platform uh, therapies, um, and also uh, the trials provided um, the opportunity to look at um, different in aggregate outcomes to capture the therapeutic uh, efficacy of a drug. It took really almost two decades uh, after the introduction of the injectable uh, platform therapies to uh, have an oral drug um, added to the therapeutic repertoire. Of course, long awaited by uh, uh, patients and, and physicians alike, and uh, the first-in-class uh, drug addressing the sphingers in one receptors uh, was uh, fingolimod with a relatively promiscuous binding to the various subclasses of this uh, uh, receptor that mediates so many physiological functions across the organism, and the follow-up follow-up drugs that um, promised to have more 
um, selectivity. Um, they are shown here, and uh, I will briefly touch upon uh, one that uh, has particular attraction in terms of perhaps uh, uh, providing benefit to patients with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. This is siponimod, um, an agent that doesn't need phosphorylation uh, to work and bind to the S1P receptors. It uh, predominantly uh, addresses S1P R1 and 5. Uh, it has some pharmacokinetic uh, properties that make it attractive, and it was explored for utility first in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis in the typical MR-based uh, design, a dose finding, in actual fact, an adaptive uh, um, uh, study. Um, and um, interestingly uh, enough, uh, the company decided to uh, embark directly on a trial in SPMS because of uh, there our uh, options had been limited and uh, under the guidance of Ludwig Kappos, um, a um, uh, event-driven design um, was uh, planned, a double-blind core part uh, where siponimod was compared with placebo and an open-label extension. Uh, and the primary outcome, time to three months confirmed disability uh, progression was achieved. Siponimod uh, did reduce the risk of uh, um, developing uh, this uh, degree of um, disability in the uh, trial period was reduced by some 21% or 26% if one applied the more rigorous outcome time to six months uh, confirmed disability progression. Now the return of the B cell, I already alluded to it, uh, capitalizing the knowledge of the differential display on cells of the B cell lineage of uh, certain molecules, CD19, CD20, and uh, of course, we uh, know the results that were obtained with rituximab and ocrelizumab. The important thing is that uh, monoclonal antibodies recognizing CD20 obviously leave intact the stem cell, the pre B cell, and the terminally differentiated plasma cell as the uh, source of the engrammed collective humoral immunological memory. Um, which may be required to maintain um, uh, defense mechanisms um, if, uh, you know, need arises when confronting microorganisms or so on. So a more specific um, um, depletion of um, a certain range of uh, cells of the B cell lineage. And uh, this is from the uh, ocrelizumab results in relapsing rheumatic multiple sclerosis where uh, in uh, twin trials, phase three trials, there was a uh, robust reduction against an active comparator interferon beta 1a, and this was um, corroborated by the usual uh, MR findings of a very marked decrease in the number of new or GAD-enhancing lesions, and also at least in one of the trials, an impact on disability progression. I would now like to turn to uh, the uh, monoclonal antibody Lm2zumab, formerly known as Campath, uh, developed uh, by Herman Waldman. Initially, the first therapeutically applied monoclonal antibody, and then uh, really continuously developed uh, against many opt uh, obstacles by Alistair Compton and Alistair Coles. Uh, in Cambridge, a monoclonal antibody that would cause a precipitous drop uh, in uh, the number of peripheral T and B cells, with the B cells recovering earlier, but the T cells staying at very low level in peripheral blood for 12 and more months. And um, uh, these are the uh, presumed uh, mechanistical effects of uh, this monoclonal antibodies recognizing CD52 
preferentially but not exclusively um, expressed on T cells, also on B cells, uh, on macrophages, uh, then um, cytotoxic uh, effects on the cells recognized and subsequently a, a reconfiguration of the repleting uh, 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 immune system. Results have, were quite impressive with a significant reduction in the relapse rate against uh, highly active uh, platform therapy um, and also uh, the co-primary endpoint of sustained accumul uh, accumulation of disability was achieved at least in, in one of the trials. The phase three trials looked at both naive patients and then those that uh, had been previously exposed to disease-modifying therapy. Now, importantly, two annual courses would provide sustained benefits. So even now into seven years following cessation of alemtuzumab, uh, clinical stabilization uh, in a large fraction of patients seems to be maintained. Also uh, very interesting in terms of some of the adverse events that have been noted. You are all aware that in some 30% of patients uh, on alamtuzumab there is the development of secondary humoral autoimmunity, ITP, um, glomerulonephritis, um, thyroid disease most uh, prominently. And uh, looking more carefully at the um, at the kinetics of the repopulation of the immune system, the London group uh, of uh, Baker uh, et al. Uh, came up with uh, this uh, cartoon demonstrating how um, the cellular composition uh, developed over time following alemtuzumab administration. There is an initial depletion of pathogenic cells. Um, it takes a while for uh, regulatory B cells to uh, come back, uh, and it is this critical time window when apparently a hyperactive uh, 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 autoreactive B cell population is not held in, in, in check and hence may uh, give rise to the development of uh, secondary autoimmunity. Another recent uh, contribution uh, or addition to the therapeutic armamentarium is an old drug, cladribin, a drug that uh, specifically um, leads to apoptosis of, auto -react of activated uh, T and B lymphocytes, initially uh, pioneered by Seib and Beutler at the Scripps Clinic um, in its parenteral formulation, but then uh, studied um, more extensively as a, as a tablet, again with a very sort of comfortable uh, scheme of uh, administration, uh, short annual uh, courses that provided significant clinical benefit, both clinically and MR-wise, in terms of NIDA uh, versus 16%, I should add, uh, that was achieved in, uh, in a placebo-controlled trial. There were issues with uh, side effects which uh, led to a protracted uh, uh, regulatory process, but as you know, uh, in uh, late August of this year, EMA uh, granted uh, um, approval of uh, this drug. Now, we of course have also uh, faced some uh, of the problems I already uh, referred to. Um, could you try to press on the left side? Click on the left, please. Anyway, um, there are problems, not everything works. And a big shock, of course, was generated when uh, the first cases of PML uh, occurred with natalizumab. Um, uh, which uh, prompted a very extensive research effort by the company to identify risk factors, obviously uh, infection with the JC uh, virus, uh, a previous history of immunosuppression, and duration of treatment, and uh, all these um, dictated the risk to uh, contract PML uh, on natalizumab. 
for example, here the uh, exposition uh, time uh, prior history, and you see that the title of the JCV antibodies uh, were related to the um, extent uh, of uh, um, um, generating a risk to uh, come down with PML um, as a consequence of natalizumab treatment. Now, of course, natalizumab is not at all the only drug that we use uh, in MS um, that carries the risk. However, with all the others, the risk is definitely much smaller. So there is a yet unexplained propensity of natalizumab to be uh, related to PML. Altogether, there are now about 750 or so cases of natalizumab associated PMLs and some 30 plus uh, with the other drugs. This is one dreaded complication. There are others, infections, uh, opportunistic infections. Listeria is, is an issue with enamtuzumab. I talked about secondary autoimmunity, the issue of uh, 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 perhaps increased risk of malignancy secondary to uh, very effective uh, immune intervention and of course, a whole lot of drug-specific adverse events. These all obviously mandate a very um, effective risk management plan to be in place and these have been uh, developed in order to minimize uh, the um, uh, disadvantages from uh, therapies we use. And we now have choices. We have a plethora of agents, definitely for relapsing MS, some uh, for the progressive stages of the disease, and the question is then uh, which uh, uh, option to, to take. And, and let's uh, go back, and uh, um, uh, because this is relevant to the decision, uh, let's uh, reconsider the categories of immune therapies available. Those uh, were the platform uh, treatments that would uh, allow uh, maintenance, uh, would provide moderate efficacy, would also be involved in a stepwise escalation approach to um, uh, patients who are not easily controlled and uh, uh, need um, a change of therapy. Uh, immunosuppression, um, if you use the WHO classification, fingolimod would uh, come into this category, and the recent additions of uh, alemtuzumab, ocrelizumab, and cladribin, which differ uh, in that short course therapies uh, result in long term uh, qualitative changes in immune function. Um, and would work beyond cessation of their administration. And they could be subdivided into those that selectively affect the adaptive or cognate immune system and those that affect both the adaptive and innate immune systems. Now, uh, you can, of course, uh, uh, rely on the results obtained in the narrow confines of a rigorously conducted clinical trial. You uh, can uh, utilize experience gathered in the context of real world uh, studies. Uh, you, when confronted with a patient, have to factor in uh, characteristics of the disease, severity, strategic location of lesions, comorbidities, uh, prognostic factors, uh, risk uh, uh, preparedness of, of the patient and then uh, make a, a choice. Uh, you can evaluate uh, the effectiveness of the treatment by clinical and, most importantly, MR monitoring. Several uh, scores have been developed, most prominently the Barcelona uh, score to assess whether a drug uh, is effective and uh, would uh, promise to uh, provide um, no evidence of detectable disease activity. Can we resort to biomarkers, a topic that has been alluded to earlier? Um, these are some uh, very recent reviews which I would like to refer to. I would tend to agree with the statement uh, made by Fred uh, Lublin earlier that we are probably uh, not there. There are some interesting uh, 
fluid uh, uh, biomarkers that have been studied uh, along the evolution of multiple sclerosis, but in an individual patient, I think, um, uh, are not yet uh, um, capable of informing us about uh, treatment decisions. Uh, you see a, a list uh, that was published four years ago. Uh, of course, uh, much uh, more has been published, but perhaps one could point out that uh, helpful, of course, are uh, the IgG index, uh, the oligoclonal bands, and I'm very happy that the uh, newest classification of the diagnostic criteria reintroduced the use of, of CSF studies, uh, anti-JC virus as a means to estimate the risk uh, of a specific therapy, the neutralizing antibodies to interferon beta, which have been uh, uh, shown to be both uh, response markers and, and markers that would indicate that a patient will eventually no longer respond to that specific immunomodulatory treatment. And the latest and very promising addition um, initially uh, looked at outside uh, multiple sclerosis, initially in the CSF, uh, but then with the advent of more sensitive uh, techniques, also in serum and, and plasma uh, by the Göteborg Group, Stockholm, the Basel Group, uh, looks at neurofilament light. NFL stands also for National Football League. Very interesting <coughs> sideline that, you know, football players obviously, uh, depending on the position they take in the game and the the bodily contact uh, have in their uh, blood uh, elevated levels of uh, NFL. And this is some recent data to um, emphasize the potential of serum neurofilament lye to serve as a biomarker of neuronal damage in MS and also as a partial response markers of uh, uh, immunomodulatory treatment. So the issues then that we face uh, with this gratifyingly broadened armamentarium relate to uh, determination of relative efficacy, effectiveness, uh, ways to optimize treatment, uh, which includes, of course, monitoring disease activity, treating to target, uh, achieving no evidence of uh, detectable activity, uh, knowing about the uh, uh, potentially additional uh, risks uh, that accumulate if you sequence treatments, um, and of course uh, all this to uh, tailor a, an individual therapeutic concept for a patient. And one could then come up uh, uh, looking at the relative pros and cons of the various DMDs uh, available with drugs that don't have the potential for drug-free remission. They are listed here. And in mild disease, you may still use the platform uh, uh, injectables. Uh, then in uh, moderately active, uh, either uh, the um, orals or daclizumab and in highly active natalizumab. And there is this category of pulsed immune reconstitution therapies that I refer to, represented by ocrelizumab, alemtuzumab, and cladribin. Now I would like to take a few words uh, on our president, or the, your president, rather, um, as uh, Gilles uh, mentioned early on, uh, we met uh, first time 30 years ago. We started our um, uh, work in, in neurology in the peripheral nervous system and then worked our way up uh, the neurexon. Um, we then shared uh, an interest in exploring the utility of mitoxantron in uh, multiple sclerosis. And uh, this is really a major contribution, of course, Ren has uh, made to uh, to the field, and finally, uh, we've been privileged to participate uh, in the various rounds of the formulation of the diagnostic criteria. I would also like to uh, remind you with fondness of this gentleman, Professor Zabuo, um, and um, I've seen uh, Monsieur le Président uh, 
conclude his recent talks with this photograph. And I was struck by two thoughts. Number one, uh, apparently traditions are upheld in Brittany. The use prime noctis of the chairman is still executed. Uh, secondly, uh, a lifelong um, uh, interest in mitoxantron uh, doesn't uh, impede fertility. <laughs> Monsieur le Président, cher ami, uh, I am confident that um, our collegial and personal friendship will even outlast that of uh, President Macron and Chancelier uh, Merkel. I would like to thank my group in Dusseldorf, the international MS community, the grant uh, agents, and merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Uh, thank you very much. We will uh, see later if we have time for a few questions. But now we have to move on. And uh, I call Professor uh, Lassmann from Vienna and uh, Professor Stankov uh, in order to introduce him. So, of course, it's a great honor, but also an impressive task for me to introduce uh, Professor uh, Hans Lassmann, who has been the leading uh, neuropathologist uh, uh, in the MS field uh, since uh, 25 years and even probably more. So, uh, may I have the next slide, please? Oh. So, may I have the next slide directly, please? Yes. So, uh, you have been the incarnation of modern neuropathology in MS uh, since 25 years. So, just very briefly, you are uh, the past founding director of the Center of Brain Research of the Medical University of Vienna and professor of neuroimmunology uh, in this uh, university. And you have also international professorship uh, in London, uh, in Germany, and so on. Um, you have been, uh, an, uh, you have been uh, at the origin of our inspiration in MS research since these years. And especially, you have teach us that MS is indeed probably an inflammatory disease, that it is also a diffuse CNS disease, but also an heterogeneous disease. And I am sure that you will discuss about this. And finally, you, 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 you teach a lot about uh, the neurodegenerative component of this disease, which is linked to energetic dysregulation, oxidative stress, and probably age-related. You have published a lot, of course, more than 500 uh, papers in international uh, journal. Um, and I, I will just summarize very briefly some of the key seminal work and achievement. First, uh, it's quite a long time ago, uh, you described that finally MS and MS lesion are very heterogeneous regarding either their uh, content in myine or oligodendrocytes, but also uh, regarding immune mechanisms. And interestingly, this uh, paper has been uh, cited more than 2,500 times, meaning that it's really an inspiring work. And uh, there are still quite open questions about this. Is this heterogeneity really patient-dependent or uh, lesion-dependent? And what are those prephagocytic lesions that have been described also? Are there a subtype or just an early stage of those lesions? But it's clear that uh, this description of lesion has been very inspiring for all immunological research, but also to think about personalized care in the disease. You have also taught us that uh, these patients are heterogeneous concerning repair, and this has also uh, uh, ins inspired a lot of discovery and research about mining biology, about the uh, discovery of the mining failure, uh, repair failure, and about the, the finding of new tools. You teach us that 
beyond lesions, it's also a diffuse disease that involves the normal wrapping white matter and the cortex. And interestingly, this paper has been, uh, has a, uh, had a lot of uh, citation also, and it has inspired a lot of research for all fields of research in MS to rethink about the tissue damage evaluation, to develop imaging tools and to understand tool and to understand the progressive disease. Uh, there is still a, a very important question about this, especially is this cortical pathology really uh, driven, driven by a meningeal or a CSF a component, but I'm sure that you will discuss about this. And finally, you, you teach the last about uh, how neuronal damage occurs and explain to us that it is linked to oxidative damage and that iron release could also play a very important role. And this opened our mind about the thinking of new therapy in this field. And recently, you described this very complex pattern of microglial activation, uh, explaining to us that these uh, cells are very complex in the lesion with different subtypes. And this, again, will inspire us about uh, new research and new tools, especially molecular imaging tools, uh, to uh, identify uh, this cell uh, in, uh, in uh, the lesion. So I will close up, but just uh, a few, uh, few words, uh, a kind of joke. You are, of course, a very uh, talented researcher in MS, but probably not only in MS, and you're also able to make very good research in other fields. As you can see on this uh, photo from the last extreme, as you were at the first row, about this uh, very original uh, French dancing, the French cancan. I'm, so, I'm sure that you are thinking about new projects uh, uh, on research about this, and this will be very inspiring. Thank you very much about uh, your talk. And so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Bruno, for this very kind introduction. And my particular thanks goes to Gilles Edon, uh, not only for inviting me here to this very honorable event, but uh, what I really always think about is about our discussions at the board of the Chaco Foundation where you and, uh, uh, and Giancarlo Comi actually changed my thinking quite a lot uh, and uh, brought somehow a very uh, focused uh, neuropathologist, neuroimmunologist towards the more clinical perspective of the whole, of the whole meaning of this. And I think that was really something which uh, uh, changed my thinking quite dramatically. And that, for that, I thank you especially. Now, uh, just my disclosures. So uh, today, I want to focus actually on two aspects. Uh, one is inflammation, and the other is uh, the mechanisms of tissue damage and neurodegeneration. And uh, although now we have seen these beautiful uh, studies by genetics from Alistair Comston, Actually, the fact that MS is an inflammatory disease is already known uh, since more than uh, 100, 150 years, and this is just uh, mentioning quite nice uh, 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 examples from Chacot, for instance, and from Babinski, who actually showed that beautifully. Now, uh, the question then came up, what is the, actually the role, the, 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 the nature of this inflammatory response? And for a long time, uh, also uh, uh, re related to the uh, findings in genetics and also in the experimental models of EAE, found a relatively simple concept that we have uh, CD4, MHC class 2 restricted T cells, which are activated in the periphery. They get into the central nervous system, get reactivated, produce cytokines, and then de damage the tissue either directly or indirectly through antibodies. Now, that is a beautiful scheme. Uh, the problem is it's the scheme of EAE and not necessarily the full picture of what we have to see in multiple sclerosis. And so for that, actually, we recently, a couple of years ago, started to do a really comprehensive study of uh, in, uh, phenotyping the inflammatory response. And so we did that on MS uh, with uh, a lot of cases of acute MS, some the shortest with a clinical duration of 14 days to several months then progressive uh, MS, and then compared the whole thing with a large spectrum of inflammatory and, uh, and non-inflammatory controls and see what is actually really the nature of the inflammatory response. So the interesting thing is when you then look at uh, just the simple uh, 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 counting of the cells, what you see is that certainly there are many T cells in the MS, both in the acute as well as in the progressive stage of MS. 
And these T cells are predominantly CD8 T cells, so MHC class 1 restricted T cells. If you count actually the CD4, the MHC class 2 restricted T cells, what you see, and be aware that these are completely different schedules, that these cells are extremely rare in, this, in these lesions and they're very, very minor numbers. What that also shows is that this T cell mediated in, or T cell inflammatory response is very similar between MS and inflammatory controls, so particular Rasmussen's encephalitis or virus encephalitis. But what separates MS actually from these inflammatory uh, uh, controls is the very, very prominent uh, 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 role of B cells, which reach actually sometimes in some cases of acute MS about four times to, uh, to, to eight times more uh, B cells than T cells in the lesions, which is actually a very interesting uh, 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 point. Now that all doesn't tell you why these T cells and B cells actually remain in the tissue. And so what we actually did to, uh, to do a more f detailed phenotypic uh, uh, characterization of the T cells. And so what you can see in particular in the fresh lesions, and this is also very nicely seen in the virus encephalitis uh, situations, that the first wave of T cell which comes in is actually the cells which are CD8 alpha beta positive they show proliferation, they get activated, and they, are, they show expression of cytotoxic molecules, and a part of these T cells actually undergo apoptosis. But what is actually extremely interesting is that there are T cells remaining in there, and these T cells which remain in there, they uh, take up a phenotype which is completely different, uh, and this is the, uh, the phenotype of so-called tissue-resident effector memory cells, which are very well characterized now also in skin lesions, and apparently it's the same in the brain. And they have very, char very important characteristics. So first of all, these T cells, to become tissue-resident memory cells, they down-regulate the receptors which allow them to aggress from the tissue. And that is actually uh, that is actually the S1P receptors and the and the, uh, and the CCR7 chemokine receptor. Now that actually tells you that to affect these cells, you can actually forget uh, the S1P receptor blockade. This is cannot act on that. The second thing is that these cells certainly don't proliferate and not, uh, are not acutely activated. So again, uh, most of the drugs which actually uh, interfere with proliferating cells. Uh, they won't act on these cells. And these cells also don't express anti-inflammatory cytokines, uh, at least what, as far as we, we know that. Uh, so they are probably not regulatory cells. We know from uh, virus-induced diseases that these tissue-resident memory cells, they stay there as a guardian in the tissue. And whenever there is a reappearance of the, the, of the, new, of the original cognate antigen, they get actually reactivated and become activated effector cells. And with that, they can actually sustain a chronic progressive in inflammation. And this is important because that's, in principle, the principle of the compartmentalized inflammation in the MS brain. Now, uh, the other thing is what is interesting, if you look at the inflammation, what we can learn is that the distribution in the lesions is not homogeneous. So the, lesion, the, the inflammatory cells are predominantly accumulated in the perivascular spaces, in the large perivascular spaces, and in cortical plaques in the meninges. But if you then look at the particular, at these sites here, which are the initially active lesions with initial stage of demyelination, uh, the number of T cells or B cells here is extremely low. So that actually cannot taken as an argument that this T cells directly actually kill the tissue. From the cortical lesions, there is now very good evidence that actually what is the important key fe feature is that these cells here produce a soluble factor which diffuses into the, into the, uh, the cortical tissue and then induces the demyelination either directly or indirectly through microglia activation. Now, what is the demyelinating factor? It's currently not clear. In EAE animals, it's clearly uh, antimyelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibodies, but they are not existing in the brain uh, in the MS patients. Uh, it has been shown by Bob Lissack, it's a factor by, produced by B lymphocytes, which is clearly not immunoglobulin because you can remove all the immunoglobulins and the demyelinating activity persists. 
What it is is currently unclear. Is it uh, a mixture of cytokines? Is it a specific factor? Maybe it's an uh, antibody with other uh, 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 specificity, but this is not very likely on the basis. So what can we summarize from that? We have actually two types of inflammation in EMS brain. This one is the acute wave of new inflammation, and that's actually what in the clinical sense is called the activity of the disease process. It's new waves of inflammation entering the brain, giving rise to blood-brain barrier damage and inducing focal lesions. And that's dominated by CD8 uh, T cells and B cells, and they get locally activated. But then you have the other thing that means that uh, these T cells, uh, uh, particularly the T cells, but also the B cells, are retained in the central nervous system. They become tissue resident memory cells. And these are actually the cells which are responsible for the compartmentalized inflammation, which gives then, is then associated with a slow progression of lesion, uh, a lesion growth and then uh, diffuse damage in the central nervous system and cortical pathology. Now, with respect to tissue damage, I think we have also learned quite a lot in the recent years. I think one key feature is that MS is not as originally defined by Jacquot and others, a focal disease of the, well, leading to white, focal white matter lesions, but it's a disease which affects the entire brain uh, with uh, the presence of the focal lesions which can expand, but with a diffuse injury of the entire white matter, and then particular also these red lesions, which are actually the cortical lesions, which develop predominantly in the later stages of multiple sclerosis, at least reach their peak at these stages. So the question then comes up, uh, what is the mechanisms behind? And here we have also to keep in mind uh, this uh, beautiful study from uh, Ren here, uh, showing in principle this uh, basic difference in the development of uh, clinical disease in the early relapsing stages uh, uh, and then in the progressive stages when the patients have, uh, uh, have uh, passed uh, this ADSS3 stage. So what have we done in that? We have actually tried to, isol uh, to, to do gene expression studies that, and we have selected two different scenarios. One is actually very fulminant acute MS lesions where you have extensively large lesions, where you have also extensive large areas like this here, which has initial stages of myelin destruction, oligodendrocyte apoptosis, so what is called the pre, uh, from Brinias, the prephagocytic lesions, and then the established lesions and normal appearing white matter. Now the second what we have used was actually cortical damage, and here there is a very interesting observation, is that this cortical subpial demyelination is absolutely MS-specific. There is no other inflammatory or neurodegenerative disease in the whole uh, of world of the humans which lead to subpial cortical demyelination. However, the inflammatory response, very similar like in MS with very similar cellular composition, is even much higher in other inflammatory uh, uh, situations like, for instance, tuberculous meningitis. So the conclusion from that is that this demyelination is not a mere consequence of, the in, of chronic inflammatory responses. It has to be MS-specific. So what we then did was gene expression studies, and what came out was actually when we now compare this gene expression in these active cortical MS lesions with tu tuberculous meningitis lesions, with Alzheimer's disease lesions and normal controls, just to get rid of everything what is just nonspecific inflammation, what is just uh, uh, a neurodegeneration, then it turned out that in the MS-specific genes there was actually quite a sim simple pathway uh, which was actually uh, the genes involved in uh, the production of reactive oxygen species uh, here, and then the mitochondrial damage and its consequences. So that was actually the only thing what came out in this comparison, so just suggesting that's a predominant pathway. Now then what you can actually do, if you know that, you can use an antibody against oxidized phospholipids just to determine those cells which have severe oxidative damage. And when you use that, you can watch in the MS brain the cells while they are dying. You see here, for instance, neurons brown with oxidized phospholipids with fragmented dendrites. You see neurons here with apoptotic nu nuclei. You see neurons with axonal transaction and retrograde degeneration. So that is actually uh, very nicely to, ident to be identified. 
Now, when you have this oxidative damage, you have to think about where do the oxygen radicals come from. And uh, again, the gene expression studies showed us very clearly that the NADPH oxidase complex, so the major source of oxygen radicals, is highly expressed in these active MS lesions. And you can again look at that in uh, pathology. You see all the blue cells are those microglia cells which express our NADPH oxidase. And they embrace with their processes neurons which are brown due to the presence of oxidized phospholipids. So that's a direct interaction. Now, that is important because uh, if you now look at uh, therapies uh, 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 which are just now starting to emerge, which may have an influence on the progressive uh, stage of the disease, then interestingly, uh, there are uh, therapies either which are involving in the, uh, in the, in the downregulation and deactivation of microglia and macrophage populations, and then there are also some uh, already uh, early stage data suggesting that uh, direct antioxidant therapies may be uh, at least partly effective in slowing down at least the progression rate of brain atrophy. Now, when you have oxidative damage, one of the major consequences is mitochondrial injury because mitochondria are the most uh, severely affected organelles for oxidative damage. And this damage can occur actually as functional disturbance, as uh, protein degradation of uh, respiratory chain proteins, and also of uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, mutations and damage. And then you have your oxidative uh, damage uh, amplified also by the electron le uh, leakage from def defect mitochondria. And uh, the outcome is actually a state of energy deficiency, virtual hypoxia with neurodegeneration. Now, is that actually evidence for that? Yes, you see the uh, mitochondrial damage on the protein level here. It predominantly affects the COX-1 molecule, which is the heme-containing uh, molecule of the complex four. Uh, respiratory chain, which is the most sensitive molecule for, uh, against oxidative, uh, uh, oxidative damage. And what you can also see, in particular in the progressive stage of multiple sclerosis, that you have uh, neurons, for instance, but also oligodendrocytes, which, uh, which are defective respiratory chain, so energy deficient uh, 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 mitochondria due to mitochondrial damage. And when you pick these cells out and then sequence the mitochondrial genome, you see extensive mitochondrial genome deletions. So with a <coughs> chronic and irreversible mitochondrial damage in these situations. Now, when we have this situation of uh, mitochondrial damage and energy deficiency, actually uh, the uh, therapeutic strategy would be to just increase energy uh, availability. And that's actually, in my opinion, the way uh, how the high-dose biotin is working. And then, if you have this situation, you get even a situation where you can do a, a, a clinical trial where your clinical endpoint is not just stopping progression, but improving disability. This is just by res restoration of the energy deficit. And uh, we will see how far uh, these uh, very promising uh, primary results are then ho hold to in uh, the larger studies. Now, then is obviously another amplification factor for oxidative injury is uh, the presence of iron in the central nervous system. Because uh, if you have uh, uh, oxygen radicals alone, they are relatively, uh, they have a low toxicity. If you have iron alone, they have also a low toxicity. But if they two come together, they just lead to the production of the hydroxy radicals, which are actually extremely toxic. <clears throat> so the question is, do we have iron in the brain and in the lesion? And the uh, answer is clearly yes. Iron accumulates in the human brain with aging. And you see that very nicely. Uh, here in the blue line is just uh, the levels of iron uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the brain tissue in relation to age. And you see a nearly linear correlation here. Now, where is the iron actually located? And interestingly, the iron predominantly is stored in oligodendrocytes and in myelin, not so much in neurons or astrocytes. So the vast majority of iron is present in the oligodendrocytes and myelin. And when you then have a destruction of these cells, you get a rapid uh, uh, liberation of the iron into the extracellular space, which is then a potent source for aggravation of oxidative injury in the lesions. It's then taken up by macrophages and microglia, and the microglia also don't like it, and they also degenerate, and you get microglia dystrophy. All things what you see in the MS lesions. <clears throat> 
So uh, uh, the question is, do we have actually with the iron story uh, something which could be used therapeutically? And the answer is probably not. It's not a good idea to reduce iron uh, because you need it for so many other uh, uh, enzymatic pro uh, uh, problems. But iron may actually be, uh, turn out as a pos potential marker for, for this, uh, for this uh, disability progression. And that comes out from, a, from the Simvastatin trial where they have done proteomics and have found that free serum hemoglobin, for instance, is very nicely associated with a rapid disease uh, and atrophy, a more rapid disease and atrophy development. And that's also now confirmed in uh, a, a recent study by Magliozzi, uh, just uh, shown as a poster in the Chaco Foundation, where she found also the free hemoglobin increased in the cerebrospinal fluid in patients with uh, high loads of cortical lesions in comparison to patients without cortical lesions. So that is uh, more or less leading to some sort of scheme how that actually works. You have in principle the inflammation where you have the new waves of inflammation which are targeted by our current treatments, the compartmentalized inflammation leading then to microglia activation, oxidative burst radical production, mitochondrial injury which actually amplifies radical production, and then the downstream consequences of functional disturbances and tissue injuries. And this whole process is then uh, uh, amplified either by the mitochondrial injury, by the microglia activation, and by the liberation of iron from the cellular stores. Now, what is interesting, these lesions are dramatic, this mechanism is dramatic in the MS lesions, but it occurs also in a similar way during normal brain aging and, uh, and, uh, 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 and vascular diseases, vascular comorbidities. And that is actually quite interesting when you now make a virtual brain of progressive multiple sclerosis. So you just take a large sample of uh, cases with progressive MS, you, they, you do a detailed lesion mappings, and then you superimpose all lesions into a, a single brain section. And then you get probability scores for lesion areas. And what you then see is this typical uh, distribution of the lesions in the progressive stage. Uh, with 100% incidence and then this white is 0% incidence. Now this is a very interesting distribution because in the early stage of MS, lesions can appear everywhere in the central nervous system, but the permanent lesions actually accumulate at these sites, and these are actually the sites which are the sites of vascular hypoperfusion in the normal brain because of the border lines between the arteries, and it's also the sites where you have predominantly in the aging brain the vascular comorbidities of small vessel disease or so-called leukoariosis. So that has apparently a consequence. It has the consequence that the new MS lesions can arise everywhere, but the persistent MS lesions accumulate at sites of, vascular perfu uh, of, of reduced uh, or low vascular perfusion in the normal brain, probably due to more axonal loss and less repair, less remyelination. And that actually has the clear consequence that when you have additional age-related vascular comorbidities, you will actually amplify the neurodegeneration, possibly also the demyelination within the MS brains. And it could be that one of the mechanisms of the recent simvastatin trial, which showed the reduced atrophy development in MS patients, is actually by just by, by, by treating vascular comorbidities in these patients. So that comes more or less to my final slide. I think we have uh, these uh, three different mechanisms acting in principle in parallel. We have the new waves of inflammation entering the brain, and that is actually what uh, Fred Lublin has very nicely defined uh, today as uh, the patients with so-called activity in clinical and MRI terms. Now then you have another inflammatory process which certainly does not appear as activity in MRI and in clinic, which is the compartmentalized or diffuse inflammation, which is then associated with a slow expansion of lesions of the cortical demyelination and diffuse injury. And then you have the downstream mechanisms of uh, neurodegeneration, which are uh, very uh, induced by the inflammatory process, but amplified by additional comorbidities and additional factors which relate uh, age and comor comorbidities and, for instance, iron-related changes. So with that, I'm uh, at the end and just want to thank the co-workers who were involved in this study. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Now we move for the last presentation by Professor Catherine Lubelski from Paris. She will be presented by Professor Roland Liblo from Toulouse. Dear Gilles, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a really a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Catherine uh, today. Uh, Catherine Lubetsky, as you know, has been important in the field of multiple sclerosis in France. But before detailing her contribution to the field, I would like to acknowledge a few conflicts of interest. Can I, je peux avoir le film, s'il vous plaît? So I have a few conflicts of interest uh, with Catherine. I'm not going to go uh, through uh, each of them because it will be uh, lengthy. And uh, here is the theme of a Star Wars that was introduced uh, by uh, Peter earlier. I would like only to stress uh, one conflict of interest is uh, the fact that uh, at the uh, extremes, uh, uh, I followed a footstep in the executive committee and I propose her name as honorary member of the Actrims. And when I wrote the letter of uh, uh, proposal, or I don't know how you call it, uh, I stressed, of course, the fact that her research in the field of demyelination and remyelination was highly uh, original, undisputed uh, international recognition was given to it, in addition to this first pillar, basic science, there is another pillar, which is clinical neurology. She contributed to uh, numerous studies, ranging from uh, prognostic factor, epidemiology, neuroimaging, immunotherapy uh, of MS patients, with uh, uh, a lot of uh, important uh, scientific uh, contribution uh, in leading journals. But that is important, but not enough. On top of that, on top of her scientific excellence, on top of her uh, dedicated human uh, warm care to patients, as we all know, her sense of integrity is uh, very strong. She has an independent uh, thinking and is a source of admiration for those who have crossed her path. Uh, by saying that it's not always the case. In some cases, we don't have admiration. Uh, she's here active and uh, kicking, and she's about to give us one of her fantastic lectures, Catherine. Thank you so much, Roland, for those kind words. Really, I appreciate. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Gilles, to have organized this incredible meeting. It's a such a pleasure to be here with friends and colleagues, with international experts, and it is such an honor for me to be here on the stage. So, Gilles, uh, thank you again, and you asked me to spoke about remyelination and to try to tell what I've been learned during the last 25 years. So these are my disclosures, and first of all, I will tell you uh, what has been acquired before. So many decades ago, we have known, uh, I try, where is the pointer? The pointer is, no, no, where is the pointer? Well, I will do without the pointer. So it was established already some decades ago that remyelination occurs after demyelination in the central nervous system. And it was first shown in experimental model. And to my, my knowledge, the first experimental model really showing remyelination has to be attributed to Robert and Marie Bungi in 1961, showing remyelination in a model of spinal cord demyelination in the cat. But then, a few years later, in 1965, it was demonstrated by two neuropathologists, Perry and Grégoire, one French, one from Belgium, that there was remyelination in multiple sclerosis. And in fact, at that time, interestingly, there was a debate to know whether, what was occurring in those shadow plaques. You see on the right, a uh, shadow plaque. And at that time, there was a debate to know whether those shadow plaques were corresponding to ongoing demyelination 
or to ongoing remyelination, and this is for ONS, and I always quote that the first description of the shadow plaque has to be attributed to Otto Marbourg, as you told us in 1906. So this was a debate, either ongoing remyelination or ongoing demyelination, and Perrier Grégoire did an ultrastructural study with electron microscopy and demonstrated that within those shadow plaques were these thinly remyelinated axons. You see here the axon with a thin rim of myelin, which is absolutely typical of remyelination. So this was published in Brain in 1965, and this is the first EM representation of remyelination in multiple sclerosis. Then, of course, last but, not, that last but not least, it was shown by Ken Smith and Yag McDonald in 1981 that remyelination is able to restore conduction velocity, and this was shown in an experimental model of demyelination in the spinal cord of the cat. So this was known already some decades ago. So what has been known, what have we learned during the last 25 years? So I will give you a non-chronological overview of what I think have been the major advances. But before that, before beginning this overview, I just want to tell you a little story. It was a long time ago, it was 15 years ago. It was in October 2002, and it was in Nice. Nice, a very lovely city in the south of France. And we had organized together with the National MS Society and MNRCEP. So it was co-organized by Steve Reingold and myself. We had organized a very nice meeting dedicated to myelin repair in multiple sclerosis and in an experimental model. And there were, there were 120 attendees. It was a very nice meeting, a lot of science, etc., a lot of, a lot of excitation. And at the end of the meeting, there was a last round table, and for the discussion at the round table, we had invited international experts, mostly clinicians, but international renowned experts. And we have been asking them during this round table to tell us what they have thought about the meeting and what are their opinion concerning myelin repair. And so they were very nice, and they said, well, we have been learning a lot, it has been extremely interesting, etc., etc., but we think that there is no future for myelin repair in multiple sclerosis. And we were so disappointed, I still remember that. So time has passed, and I will tell you now what have been the major advances of the last 25 years, and you will see whether this panel was either right or wrong. So I will begin with the first advance, which is key, which is that remyelination prevents neurodegeneration. So what are the evidence that remyelination prevents neurodegeneration? And I think that the first experimental paper that really demonstrated that remyelination indeed is inducing neuroprotection has to be attributed to uh, Bill Blackmore, who was uh, working in Cambridge at that time. And Bill has been using a rather uh, a complicated experimental paradigm in which he has been inducing demyelination using cuprison. Then he has been adding X-ray irradiation to prevent remyelination and then grafted cells to promote remyelination. And then to cut a long story short, he has been looking to the result and to the axonal density. And what he has shown, there is no pointer. He has shown that there is a reduced axonal, reduced axonal transection and increased axonal density in grafted versus non-grafted anim, uh, animal, which is illustrated here on those two graphs. So this was an experimental demonstration. The other demonstration, in fact, was shown earlier by Hans Lassmann. And again, I have to quote that Hans has been contributing so much to the field. So I quote your paper, Hans, and this was published by Kornek as a first author in 2000. And what you have been counting is the density of uh, axonal injury in multiple sclerosis lesion. And on the top panel, you see the axon expressing beta APP. So you can see that these Damage axons are uh, numerous in active lesions, of course, but they are also, with a round circle, they are also present in inactive demyelinated lesions. But if you compare the control white matter and the remyelinated lesion, so the shadow plaque, you see that there is little damage axon either in remyelinated area and in controlled white matter. And this has led on to write that there is a significant axonal injury in inactive demyelinated lesion, but only minor axonal damage within the shadow plaque. So second uh, 
uh, demonstration that remyelination promotes neuroprotection. And the third one is from our group, and it's in the work of Bruno Stankov and Benedetta Bodini. I will, at the end of my talk, tell you more about this PET scan approach, but just to tell you that using a PET scan approach which is able to quantify demyelination and remyelination, Bruno has been able to stratify the patient between bad remyelinators and good remyelinators. And to cut again a long story short, he has been looking to the fractional anisotropy of the major tracts and to the normalized thalamic volume. And what he has shown is that good remyelinators have higher fractional anisotropy value, but also that good remyelinators have a higher normalized thalamic volume. So three demonstrations, experimental neuropathology and in vivo in human, that has really convinced that indeed remyelination prevents neurodegeneration. And as you know, it's key to prevent neurodegeneration because neurodegeneration paves the way for disability progression. So this was one major advance. The other one is mostly the work of Hans Lassmann and colleagues which have tell us a lot about the extension of remyelination and which have shown that although it might be extensive, remyelination in multiple sclerosis is in most cases insufficient. I'm just going to quote two papers of Hans that is gener he generously gave to me. So remyelination, so on the left hand side, uh, Hans and uh, Bruno has shown uh, this, uh, this picture already. So in red are the areas of demyelination, in blue the areas of remyelination, and this shows very nicely that there is an heterogeneity in remyelination capacity, with some patients have been extensive remyelination, and very interestingly what Hans said is that there was a relative intra-individual homogeneity in the repair capacity. And the other very important uh, result that Hans gave in another paper, the first, the first author being Bramov, is that interestingly those remyelinated lesions are preferentially targeted by new demyelinating attack. So remyelination can be extensive but is in most cases insufficient. One important question, and it was not at all known 20 years ago, is the nature of the cell achieving remyelination. And we know now that the cells which are achieving remyelination in the central nervous system are both the oligodendroglial progenitor cells and the oligodendroglial precursor cells. So what are they? So first of all, what are the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells? These are cells that are located in the periphery of the ventricles, in the adult brain, and the work of uh, the group of Arturo Alvarez Bula, it was in 2006, has shown very nicely that those cells that are really sitting in the adult CNS at the border of the ventricle are able to very nicely differentiate into these green oligodendrocytes. So these are the progenitor cells. And the work of Brahim Naitou Mesmar and Annick Baron from Von Evercoren from our institute in Paris has shown, shown very nicely that those Progenitors from the subventricular zones are also present in the brain on MS. And if you look on the right panel, you see that in the subventricular zone of an MS tissue, you see on the left the ventricular layer. In blue are the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. And you see that there is an increased number of those progenitor cells that increase, become activated. So those cells are highly contributing to remyelination of the corpus callosum. But we know now that their con contribution is restricted and is restricted to the area which is surrounding the ventricular layer. So progenitors of the subventricular zone are achieving remyelination within uh, area restricted to the, uh, to the neighboring uh, the ventricle. In addition to those progenitors of the subventricular zone, another key cell which is achieving remyelination is the cell that we call oligodendrocyte precursor cells. So I would call them either adult OPC or parenchymatous OPC. So you see those cells schematized in green, so they are disseminated in the adult CNS. They represent up to 5% of the total cells of the brain. And interestingly, they were largely ignored because we had no markers to identify these cells. We have now specific markers. And it has been shown both experimentally, and I quote here the work of Robin Franklin in an experimental model of uh, demyelination, showing those GFP-expressing oligodendrocyte precursor cell remyelinating the lesion. But interestingly, it had been shown previously but by a very original scientist called Gus Volvic, 
that in chronic multiple sclerosis lesion, there were indeed this quiescent population of oligodendrocyte precursor cells, and I think it was the first demonstration. So both progenitors of the subventricular zone and parenchymatous oligodendrocyte progenitors contribute to remyelination in the central nervous system. And very recently in uh, our group, in collaboration with Barbara Domenex and Maria Cecilia Angulo, we have been asking whether remyelination achieved by those progenitors of the subventricular zone was different from the remyelination achieved from what I would call parenchymatous OPC. So for that, we did an electrophysiological analysis. So we did a recording of evoked compound action potential in coronal corpus callosum slice. So what you see in blue is the corpus callosum. We put the two electrodes on the two sides of the corpus callosum slide. And we have been comparing myelin formed by progenitors and myelin formed by oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And just to quote a long story short, so what you see uh, in black is the curve the two waves of the compound action potential. The first wave is corresponding to the fast wave, and the second wave is the slow wave. So you see normal myelination and the normal aspect of the evoked compound potential. And then on the two other schematic representation, you see remyelination. And what you see very clearly is on the far right, myelin done by subventricular zone progenitors is leading to a myelin which is able to be completely functional with a recording which is undistinguishable from the recording of the normal myelination. And this is in contrast with the myelin formed by the adult oligodendrocyte precursor cell. You see that the first wave, which is corresponding to the rapid wave, is missing in this myelin formed by the uh, oligodendrocyte uh, pre precursor cell. So this is very recent work that we published some weeks ago. So the cell, so we have seen the cell, oligodendrocyte progenitors and oligodendrocyte precursor cells. Then we have learned a lot during the last 15 years, I would say, about the different steps of the repair process. And this has opened our mind to the different me mechanisms for a myelin repair process, failure or success. So of course, for sake of time, I will go very brief because this is just an overview. But what I want to drive you through is what, what, what transform a demyelinated axon on the top to become a fully remyelinated and functional axon. So there are different steps that will lead the oligodendrocyte precursor to differentiate into an oligodendrocyte and to wrap myelin sheaths. I will not speak for sake of time of all of them, but there are steps of proliferation. The cell has to proliferate. There is a step of recruitment. The cell has to be recruited towards the demyelinated area. We published several papers on this, but I'm not for sake of time being, I will not speak of it. And I will focus on two steps, the step of oligodendroglial maturation and the onset of the myelination process. So let's speak about the step of maturation. And our understanding of the process of oligodendroglial maturation has been completely transformed during the last few years. And we know now that there are cues that are inhibiting the process of oligodendroglial maturation. And among the, those, there is the wind beta catenin pathway, also the lingo one expressed by the immature cell which is preventing its maturation, and I will speak of it later, but also the activation of muscarinic receptor, and I will speak of it later also, which is impairing remi uh, the maturation of oligodendrocyte. So this is on the left side, and on the right side, you see the factors which are, in contrast, promoting oligodendroglial maturation, and among them, the activation of the retinoic acid receptor gamma, and I will speak of it later. Very interestingly, also, regulatory T cells can also have a role in promoting this oligodendroglial maturation, as well as some microRNA. Some cues involved in this process of maturation, which has been deciphered during the last 10 years. Another important aspect is the onset of myelination. And for that, I will quote a very old work that we did with my long-standing friend and collaborator, Bruno Stankov, who had no gray hair at that time. And using in vitro and in vivo experiments, we have been showing, and I think it was a seminal demonstration, that induction of myelination in the central nervous system required electrical activity. I'm just going to detail a little bit. So we did that first in vitro. We had developed a very nice model of oligodendroglial culture. You see with the arrow the cell body of the oligodendrocyte, the processes that are ending by those nice myelin sheaths. 
And to address the question of electrical activity, together with Bruno, we have added in the culture medium toxins that were either blocking electrical activity, like tetrodotoxin, or in contrast, stimulating activity, electrical activity, like alpha scorpion toxin. And if you look to the results, so on the right, if you add tetrodotoxin, so you silence electrical activity, you almost completely suppress myelination. And in contrast, when you stimulate electrical activity, you strongly increase myelination. So these were in vitro experiments. And of course, we wanted to confirm that in vivo. And to confirm that in vivo, we used the uh, target of the optic nerve. So you know that the retinal ganglion cells uh, in the retina have axons which are forming the optic nerve. And in order to silence the electrical activity of the retinal ganglion cells, we have been injecting, prior to myelination, tetrodotoxin in the intravitreous space. And to cut a long story short, this showed that compared to the sham injected optic nerve, there was a profound reduction in myelination capacity when the retinal ganglion cells have no more electrical activity. So I think these were really a seminal results, which have been confirmed two years later by the group of Dukefield. And then there have been 15 years of electrical silence. It's a joke. And after those 15 years of electrical silence, there have been, you know, every six months, there is a new paper on electrical activity in myelination, as you can see, published in very high impact journal. Notably, if you uh, have time to have a look to the paper by Michelle Mangi, where she stimulates electrical activity using, using optogenetic. It's a great paper. And so many papers really confirming that uh, uh, electrical activity has a key role in myelination. So we have seen, we'll speak of that later. So we have seen the different steps of the repair process. So what about remyelination strategy? Think of the NIS, NIS meeting. So as it is an overview, I will make an overview of the different uh, repair strategy, beginning by exogenous repair strategy, grafting set that form myelin, and then speaking of endogenous repair strategy. So what about exogenous repair strategy? So several groups worldwide have been studying at the preclinical level, preclinical strategies, different types of cells for their remyelinating capacity. And interestingly, they have seen very nice remyelination by myelin competent cells, among them oligodenosa precursor cells, Schwann cells, neural stem cells. But interestingly, they have shown also that cells with no myelinating property initially were able to very nicely remyelinate when they are transplanted into a demyelinated host. And this is the fact for the factory and shifting cells and the boundary cap cell. I think to my, my opinion would be that the major breakthrough in the field is the technology of the induced pluripotent stem cells, which enable to take cells from the skin to drive them into a stem cell and then to reorient them into a specific cell, cell fate. And I just want to quote two uh, examples of this IPS technology adapted in an experimental model of uh, multiple sclerosis. This work of the group of Steve Goman showing that extensive brain remyelination that you see in green by human IPS grafted in a demyelinating mutant. And not only remyelination is extensive, but on the graph you see that there is an important increased survival. And then recently, it has been also demonstrated in the spinal cord, to show, and it has been shown by the group of Annick Baron that human IPS are able to very extensively remyelinate spinal cord demyelinated lesions. So this is exogenous remyelination. What about endogenous remyelination? We know that remyelination takes place. It is insufficient, but is it possible to promote it? So I will begin by the development of interesting screening tool to identify a pro-remyelinating candidate. I will speak about preclinical strategy, and then we'll move to the clinical trial that are uh, developing now. So first of all, the screening tool. I just want to quote this very nice work from the group of Jonah Chan from UCSF. Jonah has developed, maybe may, some of you are familiar with it, a very nice uh, uh, assay that is called the micropillar assay. These are synthetic micropillars. And within those synthetic micropillars is putting oligodendrocytes. Those oligodendrocytes, I cannot point it, but you see that they are concentric membrane wraps. And so this system has proved to be very useful as a high throughput screening tool to screen pro-remyelinating efficacy. So using that, they have been, he, he has been testing a library of 1,000 bioactive molecules. 
then identify a cluster of anti-muscarinic compounds that enhance oligodendroglial differentiation and wrapping, and finally descended with the identification of clemastin, and I will speak later about clemastin. Another asset that is developed in the lab by my other long-standing collaborator, Boris Zalk, and Boris set up a, a medium throughput model, which is interesting because it is an in vivo model. It is using the tadpole, this very small animal. It is a transgenic tadpole, so the oligodendrocytes are green. So what you see is the brain of the transgenic tadpole, the eyes, the two dark points here, and in between the optic nerve. On the right, you have the optic nerve of this transgenic tadpole, and you see all these oligodendrocytes, green oligodendrocytes within the optic nerve. And without entering into detail, it is possible in this model, just by adding in the water bath, by adding metrodinazole, to almost suppress all oligodendrocytes. So it's a very nice tool to screen now for pro-remyelinating compounds using an in vivo test. And with that, we have been testing different compounds re reported in the literature. And we have shown, for example, on the right, the most, uh, the most uh, uh, um, powerful one is clemastin. We very recently published the result of the promyelinating activity of siponimod. You see also benztropine, retinoic acid, metformin, etc. So these are strong remyelinating compounds. And other which have been tested have no promyelinating effect. So these are interesting screening tools, which has really moved the, 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 the domain. And now, what about the translation into the clinic? Where are we? So we are somewhere. We have moved a lot. For example, if we, if we think of exogenous repair strategy, so mostly the work of the group of Jean Vito Martino in Milan. Jean Vito showed, I just quote this paper, but Jean Vito shows that uh, neural stem cell transplanted in an animal with autoimmune encephalomyelitis are able to very efficiently remyelinate. And with that, there is currently, it has begun a few months ago, a phase one single dose escalation study in progressive multiple sclerosis patients. Patients are injected intrathecally with fetal derived neural stem cells. The duration will be 90 weeks. And the sponsor is the San Rafaeli Institute. So this is for exogenous repair therapy. What about endogenous ther repair therapy? So again, this has moved a lot. So you remember that I told you that using this very nice micro array uh, assay, the group of John Achan in UCSF identified clemastin with a strong promyelinating activity. And this has led to the rebuilt trial, which is a small trial, only 50 patients with chronic optic neuritis, the outcome being the latency of the visual evoked potential. It was a crossover design, and the results were positive and very recently published in The Lancet. Another study is the study which is currently ongoing in uh, the UK, in Cambridge, uh, coordinated by Alastair Coles. And the group of uh, Robin Franklin has identified that Eric Sergama, as I told you already, had a strong promyelinating activity and uh, maturation, uh, uh, an activity on the maturation. And this has led to the initiation of the Vexarotene study, which is ongoing. And now some patients are, have already been included into the study. Third study, which has, those two studies have been completed the anti, for the anti-lingo. So I told you that lingo was a strong inhibitor of the maturation process. So now we know that anti-lingo monoclonal antibody is able to increase remyelination in experimental model. And this has led very recently to two phase two study. One study in optic neuritis that we named the RENEW study, which was partially positive and the other study called Synergy in Relapsing Remitting MS, which was negative, but I think that it was mainly because they didn't have the good outcome and the good surrogate markers. And finally, let's go back to our results on electrical activity obtained a long time ago. With this data in mind, we have recently decided to set up a trial in patients with optic neuritis. So the onset of the study is planned in 2018, and Céline Noapre at the moment is wrapping up the protocol. So we plan to include 30 patients with optic neuritis, and we will propose transorbital electrical stimulation with the goal to stimulate myelin repair. The major outcome will be, of course, the latency of the visual evoked potential, but there will be several also secondary outcomes. So we, we will pr also do this study in collaboration between in Paris, and it will be in collaboration with José Sahel in the Institut de la Vision, and with Milan, with the group of Milan, with Laetitia Leocani and Giancarlo Comi. So we are all, uh, almost at the end. So what is important is that those 
methods, those new trials are developing now, but it, we have now a crucial need to evaluate myelin repair, and for that we need to have real surrogate markers of myelin repair. So this is a very, very active field of research, but I will call, I will just quote one very important strategy to quantify myelin repair, which is developed in our institute and in our group by Benedek Tabodini and Bruno Stankov. So as you may know, Bruno has developed this very nice PET imaging of myelin using a, a specific ligand, and this is here the PIB ligand. Recently, uh, Benedetta and Bruno has performed a longitudinal study in which patients had two PET scan imaging, which enabled to follow the fate of a given lesion. And you see two patients which are very contrasted. The patient one on the left, you know, in white are the lesions in which the myelin content is not modified. In red is demyelinated, and in blue is remyelination. So patient one is a bad remyelinator, and you see that patient 19 is a very good remyelinator. So this allows us to stratify patients between good and bad remyelinators. And interestingly, if you look to the graph, uh, uh, Bruno and Benedetta showed that there was a very strong correlation between the index of dynamic remyelination and the score of disability. So really demonstrating that remyelination potential is critical to determine disease evolution and disability. So here we are. So I've been telling you what uh, I've been done during the last 20 years. And I can say that I hope I have convinced you that 15 years after the NIST meeting, there have been indeed major advances in the field with recent translation into the clinic that are really opening to important and promising therapeutic strategies for multiple sclerosis patients. And thanks to the group, our group, which is dedicated to repair in MS from biology to clinical translation. And thank you very much for your attention.